Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, I almost said Truman Library, no, to the Johnson Library. <laughs> it's great to have you all here. I'm Kurt Graham. I'm the director of the Truman Library up in Independence, Missouri, and it's my great pleasure to have been invited to come down here and see some old friends at the Johnson Library and, uh, and get to visit with these great authors about the books that you've all come here to, uh, uh, to hopefully buy and uh, have signed. And, uh, and hopefully you'll have a great conversation here that'll be very meaningful to you. I, I've read these books and I'm so impressed about this, this question of Texas, and I know I can just see in this audience how much being from Texas means to you. And, and uh, so I have to, I wanna give a little bit of an introduction about myself, just since you don't know who this weird guy is that just parachuted in on you, but uh, I grew up in Wyoming and uh, you know, spent my, my youth and, and whatnot there, and so I have this really strong sense of what it means to be from somewhere, but I also have a very strong sense of what it means to be of somewhere. And I sense that that's something that, uh, that Texans have in spades. And so, uh, and I think both of these authors have, have captured that sense, and I think you'll, uh, you, you'll appreciate that. I, I, I wanted to make that disclaimer about not being from Texas because I feel like I've kind of walked into a Lyle Lovett song. You know that one, that's right, you're not from Texas. <laughs> But, um, but I console myself with the, the refrain in that song it ends up saying, but Texas wants you anyway. So I hope that will, yes. hope that will be the case, that, uh, that we can uh, have a great conversation here. Anyway, um, I'm also delighted to be here just on, on behalf of the Truman Library because you know, President Johnson and President Truman had such a great relationship and so much respect for one another. Uh, I have a tape of Johnson calling them on Christmas morning, 1968. Um, saying to Bess Truman his, that his staff had just given him a, a, a list of all the things he had accomplished, all the legislation that had been signed during his administration. And he said, you know, Bess, I look back on that and I realize that about half those things started with Harry. And he gave him credit for that. And I thought that was, that was wonderful. He came to the Truman Library, as you know, to sign the Medicare Medicaid Act in 1965. So uh, I feel like Harry Truman would want me to be here. I feel like it's, it's a little bit of a debt that we, can, uh, that we can pay back. And again, we all have a profound respect for both of these really incredible presidents. But speaking of two very important and profound people, we have here with us uh, a couple of great authors. That, that, yeah. that, 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 well, I mean, they dress alike, they act I, alike. I mean, it's, just, there, there's, it's, it's, really, it's really quite impressive. This uh, is the way Texans dress. Right? <laughs> and I, I overdress. I, I, I was so afraid. I didn't know how to work. Well, um, you know, I, I have like a whole bunch of bullet points about each one of these guys. And I said, I could spend 45 minutes introducing you. And they said, they all know us. They all know us. They all get it. So you all know Professor Brands, who is here, University of Texas. la di da di da Okay. Published in all kinds of places and written some amazing books, including the one that we're going to visit about tonight. And of course, Larry Wright is an author and screenwriter, playwright, uh, writes for The New Yorker, among many other uh, publications. Has also written some great books. I know he's also a known quantity to you here, so I won't, I'll, I'll dispense with any further introduction if that's all right. But you can give him a hand as well. <laughs> the, uh, you know, just reading their work, I have a profound respect uh, for them. But the thing that has, has really solidified that for me tonight already is that they both look younger in person than in their pictures, <laughs> which we better I want to get better photographers. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using the picture that's 10 years old. Yeah. Thank you, Kurt. I'm telling you. I mean, these guys, they have it. So I, I want to figure out how, how you do that. Anyway, we're here tonight to talk about the great state of Texas. And... Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, as I said, I read both these books, and, uh, and by the way, uh, Bill wrote a great book also on Harry Truman and MacArthur, and so we had a chance to do a program just like this at the Truman Library a couple of years ago, and they're still talking about it, so I have every confidence that you're going to enjoy this, uh, this thing tonight. But I kind of wanted to throw it to our authors here and ask them kind of a, uh, an opening statement, if they would. You know, we talk about Texas as being somewhat unique. It's, it's a... It's a you know, call it Texas exceptionalism, call it whatever ever you will. But my question is, a lot of other states would feel that way. If we were in Massachusetts or Virginia or Missouri or California, these states would say, well, we've had a profound impact on, on the republic. We've had a profound impact on America. So I hate my first question to be so what, but what's the big deal about Texas anyway? <laughs> you want to start? No, you start. Okay. Well, 
part of the big deal of taxes is that there's a, when people, when Americans, we'll, we'll start with sort of when Americans first envisioned Texas, they knew that Texas was foreign territory. And that was what appealed to Texas about the first Americans who came here. And this group was led by Stephen Austin. And Stephen Austin came to Texas precisely because it was not the United States. So in the 19th century, there was this Western movement in the United States, and people were moving west. They would move west from Virginia to Kentucky and from North Carolina to Tennessee. And by the early, 19, early 1820s, the frontier had moved essentially to Texas. But the appeal of Texas was that it was not the United States. People were going to Missouri, which is part of the United States. They were moving to Illinois, which is part of the United States. They were moving into Michigan, which is part of the United States. The appeal of Texas was that it was not the United States. And the reason for that particular hook was, if you came to Texas, if you came to Texas with Stephen Austin, you got an enormous amount of free land from the Mexican government. You didn't get free land from, from, from the Mexican government. You didn't get free land from the American government. The American government didn't get in the business of giving away land until the 1860s. So there was this huge draw to Texas. And you could get 4,000 acres of land for free. You could get a league of land from, tech, from the Mexican government for coming to Texas. And this was utterly at odds with American policy, but you could go to Texas. So part of the appeal was you could get all this land. But the other thing is that part of the appeal for a particular group of people, like James Bowie and William Travis and any number of others, was that it was beyond the reach of American law. And these were people who had reason to want to leave American jurisdiction. Among debt collectors, among sheriffs and litigators, you probably, many of you, will be familiar with the shorthand GTT, which you would write across a bill, and it meant unpayable, I mean uncollectible, because it meant gone to Texas. They're not coming back. <laughs> and so, but... Texas attracted all these people, all these Americans, who eventually got it in mind that maybe Texas should become part of the United States. And this group was led by, the first group was led by Stephen Austin, this group was led by Sam Houston, who came to Texas as what in those days was called a filibuster. And a filibuster in those days was not a delaying tactic in the US Senate. It was a person, and it, came, it comes from the Dutch freebooter, it was a pirate. It was a land pirate, somebody who was going to go and take over foreign territory. Anyway, so the second group came. And then eventually we'll get to the Texas Revolution, and Texas declares its independence. And this is where Texas exceptionalism kicks in. Because Texas was that, well, Texans would say that unique instance of a people that gained their independence without being part of the United States. And then they created their own republic. And, but this is where history plays its ironies of people. So the part of Texas history that Texans are most proud of, and the thing that they will say when people ask, so what's the big deal about Texas? Texas was an independent republic. Texas was this independent country, and that's one of, those, the, one of the six flags is flying over Texas. But the irony is that Texans in 1836 had no desire to be an independent country. They wanted to immediately become part of the United States. So this formative episode in Texas history came about because the United States would not take Texas in. <laughs> Texas came knocking, and the United States said, go away. And so what would become the pride of Texans history and an emblem of this Texas exceptionalism was something that was forced upon Texans. But like good Westerners who sort of make use of whatever comes at hand, this was turned around and became the source of Texas pride. I'll elaborate more on this later. Well, <laughs> that makes sense because you really do have to be special to be rejected by the United States. Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, that's, that... This was a time when they were taking anybody, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> except Texans. Well, it's interesting to me because you know, if you think about being of a place or from a place, in the rest of the world, or even in the United States, there are only a few places that have such a strong cultural identity mm -hmm. that, uh, that people immediately ascribe things to you. 
uh, and you know, sometimes they're a little out of date. Like if you're from Chicago, you're not in the mob anymore. But still, you know, there there is that it well, hangs over the uh, <laughs> the reputation, you know. And so Hollywood, places like that, they have. But Texas is an entity that everybody in the world has an opinion about. And there's a phrase in Norwegian, uh, det var helt Texas, which means, according to my Norwegian friend, it was totally bonkers. Mm. So every, it says that they say it rather ad, you know, admiringly, but everybody in the world has an opinion about Texas. And I think it goes back to this mythology that uh, kind of Bill laid the groundwork for it, but you know, the, the idea of being independent, even though the rejection part we don't play up, but the, you know, the being independent was part of it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the cowboy myth was very, very mm -hmm. powerful, the oil myth, all of these things, and all of, a lot of it amplified and uh, doctored by Hollywood. Uh, where all those old John Ford movies were shot in Arizona parkland, and everybody thinks that, you know, that's what Texas looks like. But this myth is so, uh, so deeply grounded in the world imagination. I, I remember when, when Roberta and I were young, we taught at the American University in Cairo, and I used to go horseback riding out at the pyramids. And I, I grew up in Dallas, so I'm not, uh, you know, cowboy. <laughs> but uh, they found out somehow that I was from Texas. I probably told them. And uh, so they- It just came up. Texans have a tendency <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so I, they started calling me Texas. And you know, they don't call you New Jersey or Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And so one time, you know, Roberta and I went out there and they gave her this old nag and, um, and oh, Texas, we've got a horse for you. And two guys bring up the stallion. He's, yeah. His paws are ripping the air. His nostrils are flaring. <laughs> it scared the crap out of me. You know? <laughs> but being Texas, you know, I had to get on this horse. And he took me halfway to Libya. <laughs> and I felt I was literally astride the Texas myth. And uh, then, uh, then later that year, um, during Ramadan, which is the fasting period in Islamic countries, uh, and they don't eat in, you know, all during the daylight hours. And I was teaching during the daylight hours, and I had two occasions where uh, students passed out in class. And I thought, this isn't gonna work, so I, started, I decided I'll take them to movies. And back then, there were, Cairo was full of uh, uh, English language movies. And I took them to uh, Midnight Cowboy. And, uh, <laughs> probably the wrong movie to, to, to take these very impressionable uh, young Egyptians to see. But uh, if you can remember the movie, uh, John Voight plays a, a young man who was working in a drive-in uh, theater, movie theater in Big Spring, Texas. And he, he has a little place behind the theater. And on the wall of his squat little bedroom is a picture of Paul Newman and HUD. And, uh, and you know, here is John Voight trying to be that character. And so, but he winds up going to New York and dressing up like a cowboy and being a gigolo. Kids were having a little trouble with this. But to me, this was exactly what, you know, his journey of the distance between being a, tech, a real Texan and being a filmic version of that was a lot about the tension that Texans normally endure. Just like me looking at that horse, you know, a real Texan would be able to jump on that horse and ride him without any trouble, but you know, they, they expect me, the delegate from Texas, to be that person. And I think it's in some ways empowering mm -hmm. to think that, that people think that you're larger than life, mm -hmm. that you know, you, uh, and the qualities that Texans have in the popular imagination that we're uh, braggadocio, uh, narcissistic, uh, careless with money, careless with our personal lives, uh, uh, untrustworthy with the truth. Those are uh, no desirable traits, though. I well, really that's, those, that's what pe people tend to think of Texans, mm -hmm. in, and it's ironic to me that the person who most exemplifies that is this Manhattan billionaire in the White House. <laughs> but, 
when Texans think of themselves, we tend to think of ourselves as kind of hardworking and earnest and non-neurotic. Uh, there's a big disparity between, I think, the way that Texans view themselves and others view us. But a lot of it all goes back to this powerful myth, which rightly or wrongly has powered the sense of exceptionalism right from the beginning. You know, that's, that's really amazing to hear sort of both historically and culturally there's this kind of uniqueness to Texas that gives it, uh, you know, as an outsider looking in, you know, because you, 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 you see the myth, you kind of see the history and how it, how it feeds into that. And I want to get back to both of those topics eventually, if there, uh, as you both have more to say, I know, but I wanted to jump just for a minute. You kind of gave me the natural segue there. Let's talk about politics for a minute. Um, it, it's very interesting to me to, to look at Texas from the outside because you wonder, is Texas... The question I have is Texas leading the way. In other words, is, is Texas a sign of where we're going, or is it a is it a, a reflection of where we've been? I mean, is it is it is it something that's going to take us down a down a different path? And just the recent Senate election here, which was so very close, surprisingly close, at least from an outside perspective. I mean, that that's huge to think of a state of this size possibly being reliable in one party and possibly flipping to another. That's that's a that's a big deal. What's going on here politically? You're probably more in tune with current politics of Texas than I am, but I will say that Texas, in, in many ways, Texas is like other states mm -hmm. in the sense that from, well, from the 1860s until the 1970s or 80s, Texas was just like every other state of the former Confederacy in which it was dominated by the, Republic, by the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. That didn't mean that everybody thought alike. It was a two-party state, but it was all within the Democratic Party. So there were conservatives and there were liberals, uh, more conservatives in Texas and perhaps in some other parts of the South. But they all called themselves Democrats. And the reason they did was that they were legacy Democrats. They were never going to join that party that had been the party of suppressing secession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was played out in that regard. But... Texas was different in one respect from every other state of the Confederacy, and that was it had one foot in the West. Mm -hmm. And so Lyndon Johnson could imagine that one day he might be president of the United States at a time when that was beyond the vision of any other Southern politician. And mm -hmm. the reason for this was there was an implicit embargo on Southerners in the White House between the 1860s and the 1960s because the South was the region of Jim Crow, and this was an embarrassment to the rest of the country. It wasn't so embarrassing that the rest of the country made the South change. That would wait until the 1960s. But it was embarrassing enough that voters in other parts of the country would not vote for a Southerner. But Johnson thought to finesse that, because Texas is partly a Western state, as well as a Southern state. And Johnson played up that Western part. Of course, he was a son of the Hill Country, and when he traveled around, he always wore a Stetson hat. This is the hat of the West. And he made a very big deal of that. And so Johnson was the first Southerner, in the sense of from the former Confederacy, who could imagine that he might be president one day. Now, in fact, he only got into the White House through the side door. But it was critical when he became president that he had been playing up the Western roots, but now his Southern roots, or the Southern roots of Texas, right. became essential because Johnson recognized that it was going to be hard enough to get the South to swallow civil rights reform. But it was more likely if they were told they had to be dragged into the 20th century by a fellow Southerner, mm -hmm. someone who could speak the language, to be lectured to it by, let's say, you know, if John Kennedy had lived, a Massachusetts Yankee, no, I don't think that's going to work. Mm -hmm. So Texas historically, and in American politics, has had this dual identity. And astute Texas politicians have been able to play the Western card when it's useful. They'll play the Southern card when that's necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was young and growing up in Dallas, Texas was blue. Mm -hmm. And California was red. Right. And, uh, you know, we think of these as these opposing entities, and in many ways they are, but they, and I think of them as being like strands of the U American DNA, <laughs> and they're constantly revolving in a relationship with never coinciding, Texas and 
California would like to define themselves as opposing entities. And they're fascinating models. Um, we, we moved to Texas in 1960, and um, my dad was a, a, a veteran, and uh, you know, like a lot of veterans, he was an Eisenhower man. He had, you know, he fought in Europe. Uh, so he, he, we moved into Dallas, and Dallas, you know, we were part of what we didn't realize at the time, this big migration into Texas that came from different political traditions, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Dallas was the first city in Texas to turn blue, to turn red. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and it was a part of a wave that eventually encompassed the entire state. And you know, we've been red, red, red uh, mm -hmm. for more than 20 years. Not a single uh, statewide elected Democrat. Right. And the same, the opposite is true in California. Not a single statewide elected Republican. But we're undergoing right now this massive immigration that is that is also turning our city, tur turning our state into a different entity, and Cal in, in Texas is turning purple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's slow and awkward, and but if you look at this previous election, the most striking thing to me was not that the cities were all blue. They've all been blue for years, except for Fort Worth, which finally did turn blue. It's the suburbs. They had always been bright red, but suddenly Williamson County and places like this were turning blue. And that's one reason you see the state legislature, which is now in session, um, being so much more moderate than it was last time around. I think they've had this, you know, they've had the riches scared off of them. Mm -hmm. You know, things are really changing and they're changing fast. If, uh, if Texas does change, it changes the national balance you know, oh, yeah. totally Completely. Not only it changes it, it, it's like a somersault, and and I, the Republican Party has been very frightened of this, not just locally but nationally, mm -hmm. and yet has done nothing to mend the main problem, which is they only appeal to uh, to wealthier uh, white and older people, mm -hmm. and you know in order to broaden the base. Uh, if they're going to continue to be a relevant force in American politics, they have to change. Mm -hmm. And Texas is, we have 38 electoral votes now. We're likely to have 42 after the next census. Mm -hmm. California has 55, but it hasn't gotten any more delegates, uh, electoral votes, since 2003, and it won't in this next census. And New York, of course, has been losing, you come mm -hmm. from the Truman Library, almost mm -hmm. since the Truman era, mm -hmm. uh, it's been losing population and right. influence, been surpassed by Florida now as, as, an, as a number two state, number three state. Um, so by 2050, Texas is uh, expected to double in population, mm -hmm. at which time we'll be about the size of New York and California combined. And so Texas really is the future. I just don't think that Texans have owned up to the fact that it's our responsibility now. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10% of all the school children in America are Texans right now. Wow. And so the decisions that we make in this state, and we're not always capable of producing the best decisions, but they don't have, they're not local. They're mm -hmm. not even national. They're international in scope. And you know, I think if we fail to, pick up the challenge, it'll be un-Texan of us. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, a statistic that you just shared about doubling the population in that short a time, because it's not just that the population will double, num I mean, numerically, but it will be a completely different demographic makeup as yeah. well as it, as it doubles. So that, that, will, that will have a lot of yeah. impact on. And Texas and California have very, very similar demography. Right. Uh, you know, we're both majority minority states, which is, mm -hmm. replicates what will happen in America soon. Sure. And about 40% Hispanic. Very, very different models of politics and economy, but oftentimes very similar outcomes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you both about the, uh, in, in your book, Larry, you've got a chapter that I thought was really uh, a very clever way of looking at this sort of, if you want to call it purple, phenomenon in, in different states, because I'm not sure anybody's really turning purple. I think that you make it, you make a distinction between uh, AM Texas and FM Texas. Yeah. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, you can drive through Texas and be in two different states. 
you know, if you're on the AM band and you're listening to Rush and Laura and, you know, and... Uh, Sean the, Hannity. And yeah, and Paul also the, the evangelicals and, you know, the, it's... And that's Texas. Yeah. But, and that's what a lot of people outside of Texas think Texas is. Right. And, uh, and, you know, and it exists. Mm-hmm. But if you can just push the button and you go on to the FM band, you're in the kingdom of NPR. And you're, you know, it's, it's, you're just like, you could be in Seattle. You could be anywhere, you know, it's, it's just, it's, very blue. it's the very same mm-hmm. ethic. And everybody's very well spoken, you know, and uh, it's, but both of those entities live simultaneously in the same space. Right. And in some, you know, in Texans, tend to ally with one or the other, but you can move about in that, uh, that era. And I think a lot of, I can't, one of the things I get a kick out of in Texas is I feel like a lot of the things that people associate with AM culture, mm-hmm. like country western music, mm-hmm. and I'm in a band, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I participate in that. Right. I, I like the I like the, the, you know, the, the, the juice you get out of this kind of raw Texas stuff, and, and, and that's part of what makes Texans feel exceptional. you play mostly the blues, right? I, we play a lot of Texas and okay. Louisiana music. All right. So, okay. yeah. Well, I just want you and, to... And a lot of rockabilly. So, right. if you want... Yeah, Aaron, well, yeah. Yeah. That, that would count. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that when I got my rental car at the airport, I, I don't know what this says about me, but it took me a long time on the FM dial to find a country station. I went clicking through. There, I, I was surprised. I thought Austin would just be full of country music stations. And... So let me ask you, Larry. Do you think the FM Texans identify so clearly as Texans, as the AM Texans? I think I, I think you know there are these different stereotypes, and there are you know right now we're creating a whole different kind of Texan, mm-hmm. and that is you know these are the people that are videographers, uh, filmmakers, and, you know, it, the, the computer, the tech world, and all that sort of thing. It's all people that really identify with Texan, but I think they ally. What they do is they go to Bucky's and they dress up like Texans. And, but they, they, <laughs> so I grew up in Oregon, and in the early 1970s, the governor of Oregon, Tom McCall, very uh, notoriously sort of stood at the southern border of Oregon and said, California, please come visit, but for heaven's sakes, don't stay. And people were in Oregon would uh, have bumper stickers that said, don't Californicate Oregon. <laughs> so let me ask you what you've described. People making movies, high yeah, tech. Right. Is Texas becoming Californicated? Yes, and that's good. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, our governor, I, he, it's, it's crazy, this, this anti- California thing, we have very different political and economic models. And, uh, and I think it, there, there's a tremendous, it's like the, AM, it's, it's like the di- different poles of a battery. You know, the, we, and it, it's one, wonderful to live in a country where states can have such different approaches. But when Governor Abbott talks about Californicating our, our he's talking about like plastic bag bands and stuff like that. Uh, tree ordinances and you know when he cites these things, the and in my band, but the drummer uh, on his kit, he has a, a, a bumper sticker that says "Don't Californicate Texas Music," which I means what I have no <laughs> idea, but the uh, it is true I think that Texas has had a very successful economic model, and uh, California has struggled, and I think uh, you know Jerry Brown was a, a master politician to pull that state out of the nose drive that it was in economically and, and come in with what he said here in the library, a $13 billion surplus, whereas we had an $8 billion deficit. Uh, so it makes you wonder which is the more conservative entity. But I, I, th- I think that these are all expressions of Texasism. So how much of the Texas identity do you think depends on external stereotypes of Texans, and Texans playing off or sometimes living up or living down to that stereotype. The fact that Texans are not universally beloved outside the state of Texas. And- I've noticed that sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is that something Texans wear as a badge of pride? Uh, it's a terrific liability, I think, sometimes. I, 
and, and I think it can be, you know, just thinking about Lyndon Johnson and how hated he was, in part because of the stereotypes that people had about Texas. Mm -hmm. And I was embarrassed by him. I remember when the first time I ever heard my voice was in language lab. You know, in, in, I was taking Spanish. And I, I heard myself, and I sounded like LBJ ordering a plate of tacos. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I had, actually, I had a, a Dallas accent where you talk through your nose. And I thought, man, I'm going to lose that. I will never, never talk like that again. Uh, so I, I was fleeing. I was a, a self-hating Texan. Uh, you know, I wanted to get as far away from that. And a lot of that was, you know, the stereotypes that people have that I had about my own state. And it blocked me from, in, for instance, with LBJ, mm -hmm. from seeing clearly who he was. Although, I have to say, you know, I was a conscientious objector during Vietnam, and that, you know, very much affected my life and my opinion uh, about LBJ. But I think these stereotypes blind us to who we really are. But Bill, do you think that that, 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 that could be an American phenomenon as well? Because certainly earlier in, in, in American history, Americans were always sort of taking their opinions of who they were based on what people in London or other places thought of them. And so is, is that unique to Texas to say that it's the outside looking in that makes us either feel good about or bad about who we are? I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but you might be absolutely right. And in some ways, Texas is sort of just like the rest of the country, but mm -hmm. more so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a smaller version of the larger country. Mm -hmm. It is striking how, certainly in the 19th, oh, now this is interesting because maybe in the 19th century, yes, Americans, especially those who are concerned with culture, mm -hmm. with the life of the mind, with the arts, they had to get confirmation from the old world right. before they felt that they were doing okay. And often that was withheld. Mm -hmm. And so there was this sort of chip on the American shoulder. And somebody like you know, Noah so. Webster would come along and basically create this American language. And we'll take the, the U out of words like color and neighbor mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is a different language. Mm -hmm. And so, so I hadn't thought of it in these terms. But the rest of the United States grew out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've reflected on this. And, and I'm not a native Texan, so I'm going to put it to the native Texans in the audience. I think that one of the things that gives rise to this Texas identity is that Texas as this geographical place is, I'll put it this way, you have to make an effort to love it. Because yeah. there are large parts of Texas that are not particularly appealing. And I grew up in Oregon, and I was just thinking, I was just in Oregon last week, and I was sort of reflecting on the fact that in Oregon, Stuff just grows. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in Texas, it seemed like every living thing has to fight hard for life. And everything has thorns or spikes or it's rocky or it's dry or it's poisonous or, or something snakes like or that. Scorpions. Yeah. And and both of you have mentioned sort of California and Texas as these states and places and states of mind that are sort of comparable. But in, tech, in, in California, there is nothing like the state of Texas mind. There isn't that California identity. Now, part of that is due to the fact that there are two Californias. There, you, one could argue there are four or five At least, Texases. Yeah, right. But Southern California is a very different place than Northern California. There's Los Angeles and there's the Bay Area, and those are quite different. So that's part of it. But I think the other part of it is that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now, and I may be speaking out of turn, but I'm speaking as someone who's not a native Texan, and I didn't get here soon enough to be indoctrinated in the seventh grade Texas history class. <laughs> so, but with this Texas identity, there is a combination of this sense of superiority, but as often happens, it sort of masks or is twinned to a kind of inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. Texans do care about what other people think about Texas, even though they often don't want to admit it and they don't accept it on others' terms. And, but with, I've lived in California, and California, there's nothing like this. It's okay. It's as though with California, 
What's not to love? Yeah. Yeah. You know, everywhere in California, you look around, my God, Big Sur, and here's Yosemite, yeah. you know, Lake Tahoe, and I've really died and gone to heaven. Yeah. When people get to Texas from the outside, they don't necessarily think they died and went to heaven. They and as died. Phil Sheridan famously said, if he owned hell in Texas, he'd rent out Texas and live in hell. <laughs> There's one of the things about Texas, you, you know, you were talking about how California doesn't affiliate with itself the way that Texas does. And, and, and I can see that Texas is not beautiful in most respects. My friend Steve Harrigan, who's here and hiding out in the back, uh, talks about how Texas is where everything peters out. You know, the South comes to an end, the Great Plains, Mexico, the West, they all come to die in Texas, you know. And uh, there's... There is a there is that sense that um, it's uh, and yet there are very few you know speaking of the brand there are very few states that one could just simply draw you know the way that almost every Texan can draw the state of Texas and 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 a lot they of they all have a fruitcake in the state of Texas. That's probably state true. <laughs> well, they don't always have a library on the campus in the shape of a Texas, but uh, the uh, this actually is true. Uh, so <laughs> Futi doesn't brag about it. I know, anymore. I they know, it's crazy. To. But uh, it's not, it, architecturally, it's not, it doesn't work so well. But, uh, but you know, there is this sense, uh, I have this theory of Texas culture, and I don't know how it applies to, uh, to other places, but I think of it having three levels. And there's a primitive, you know, level one, which is <laughs> barbecue, boots belt buckles, blue bonnets, you know, just all, all the bees, yeah. yeah all the uh, you know, this is all the raw stuff that people all over the world associate with Texas, and we do too. And that's just like the primitive where we came from stuff. And then my whole life in Texas has been going through this level two, which is when money comes into the state. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, an, it's a period of education and sophistication and neurosis. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, you start looking around and you think, how do other people do it? You know, I remember, I remember the importance of, of Neiman Marcus in Dallas was a, a classic uh, level two. We're going to show you how you're supposed to spend your money and how you live. And, uh, and it's when you send your kids away to school. It's when you build the opera companies and, and then you bring in World class, or as Ross Perot, world class. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real level, level two phrase. Yeah. Bring in these world class architects so that every city begins to look like a franchise right. of, of an American city. And there are all these other people's ideas on display. And it is a worthy period because you, you, you learn what the world has to offer. And, and, but then there, I think that there comes a, period, not always in other cultures or even in our own, only rarely, a, a kind of level three where you have been through all the education and the cosmopolitanism and everything that level two has to offer. And then you return to your roots and see what's there. And uh, this revelation came to me at Cafe Andy when I was eating a rabbit enchilada uh, <laughs> and with a creme fraiche topping. And uh, it was a real level three experience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I thought about uh, Roberta and I love uh, Alvin Ailey and that, that wonderful dance he uh, choreographed called uh, Revelation about growing up in this little Baptist uh, church in Rogers, Texas. and. Uh, you know, I think you can look at Beyonce's Lemonade album where she goes back and studies, you know, the, 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 the hip hop and the country music of Houston and so on. There's, there's, you know, the architecture, I love the architecture of the UT campus, for instance, but you can, the Lady Bird Wildflower Center to me is a, a great example of level three. And our new library, I think, is a good example of that. You know, you take native materials and you know, and with very sophisticated take on it, and you make something that is purely of the place, and of our time, but it and it stands it stands I think uh, against anything else that you would see in the rest of the world. But it is of the place, as mm -hmm. you would phrase it. I got a question for you, and so you've just hinted at it. One other thing that struck me about Texas, certainly, 
modern Texas, so let's say post-World War II Texas, is that it is many cultures at the same time. Yeah. And so Houston, to me, is one of those, today, is one of the most remarkable places on Earth. Totally. Houston is to the 21st century what New York was to the 19th century. It was the place where the world came, uh -huh. and there were you know, dozens, scores, hundreds of languages spoken, people, all sorts of cuisines, people yeah. coming from everywhere. And I was very struck by a motto I heard from somebody in Houston who said, you know, come to Houston. We're not going to help you get ahead, but we're not going to get in your way. Yeah. And New York was that way in the 19th century, but as cities mature and the institutions mature, then there are more regulations. And now, in fact, I was riding in a cab where this, the cab driver was, it was in Houston, and he had been to New York, and he came back. And he said, there are just too many regulations, too much yeah. stuff in New York. But Houston is that way. But, so, but interestingly, so when you get to level three, as you say, it, you sort of come back to the roots. But if you think about it, so for people like Alvin Ailey, uh -huh. people like Beyonce, their roots aren't belt buckles and boots. So is there any point at which the Texas culture shifts to acknowledge that Texas is a very different place today than it was when these myths got started. Oh, that's a really good point. I think that the, the flaw in our, our mythology is that it is, it's Anglo culture, for the most part, mm -hmm. that it exemplifies. And that's what people think of Texas, too. Uh, you know, when, if you take your archetypal Texan in the minds of people, uh, most people around the world, it's John Wayne. The cowboy. And uh, it's, it's, it's not Beyonce. Um, but I think, you know, of course, I mean, half the cowboys were black, black or Hispanic. I, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that artists today are redefining that, and you know, and, and they're powerful artists that are really, you know, carrying that message. And I think that's that's one of the things that's exciting about being in Texas now. Is it, I, I totally agree with you about Houston. I also think it's true of Austin. You know, that it's a very fertile place where the creative imagination is running wild, and we're reimagining the, the culture that we're living in. And so do you want to respond to the book reviewer who said that Larry Wright claims he's from Texas, but he's not, he's from Austin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up in Abilene and Dallas, so I feel like I've done my time. Yeah. <laughs> So here's something else, and this gets back to your level one, two, and three. Yeah. So it seems to me that the formative years of Texas culture were years when the state was, by and large, poor. And the 19th century was a time of hard scrabble in Texas. And again, getting back to the comparison with California, California was born rich. Right. People came to California for the gold rush. And so there was money, there was opera, there was high culture in San Francisco within two years of the gold discovery. So is that part of the story that the things that you're talking about, barbecue, you know, barbecue is where you take the worst cut of meat right. and you, you smoke it forever right. and you can finally, you know, choke it down. Yeah. And, you know, the boots, the boots we're talking about originally were not the $2,000 custom boots. Right. These were, you know, $5 boots right. because these were work boots. So is that it? Is that sort of the secret and is that... Is that the sort of the secret of the staying power of the myth? Because even as Texas gets wealthy, it's very appealing, especially in an egalitarian ethos that we live in, even if it's not a particularly egalitarian society, the idea that we're all just ordinary folks. I think the working man part of that is, is, is you know, deeply implicit in the whole idea of the myth. But luck is also a big thing. You know, I think, Oil is all about mm -hmm. gambling. And, uh, you know, I, th I think about, you know, oil is, is central to Texas's relevance to, to the whole world. I mean, mm -hmm. without oil, Texas would never have mattered really at all. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Texas has changed the whole world at least three times, you know, in terms of petroleum. Uh, 1901 with Spindletop. Uh, which was a gassy hill outside of Beaumont, and the schoolboys used to set it on fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, this con man named Patillo Higgins predicted he would find oil at a thousand feet. 
And um, at 1,020 feet, uh, suddenly six tons of drilling pipe shot up over the derrick. And, you know, it was terrifying. And, and uh, all the roughnecks crept back and then it, it quieted down. And then suddenly this roar and rocks start flying and then oil starts flying 150 feet into the air. In the first gusher, 1901. And Patillo Higgins had hoped to get a well that would produce 50 barrels a day, 100,000 barrels a day, more than all the oil produced in America at that time mm -hmm. for the next eight days until they capped it. And then the next moment, 20 years later, that was East Texas, West Texas. There was one well in West Texas who was producing 10 barrels a day. And uh, uh, in 1921, a guy named Frank Stardrill, Pickerel, Frank Pickerel, uh, climbed on top of the derrick, and he had an envelope, and he opened up the envelope, and it was full of rose petals, and he, he sprinkled, you know, sent the rose petals into the air. The rose petals came from a group of nuns in New York who had invested in the well. <laughs> <laughs> and they went to a priest who blessed the rose in the name of the saint of hopeless causes, and the saint's name is Santa Rita. And that was, in many ways, the most important well ever drilled in America, because it was in the Permian Basin. They only, they didn't have a geologic report. They, they, they mm -hmm. picked the site because it was close to the railroad track. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and the University of Texas got its first royalty check that August for $516. Uh, now, $30 billion later, it's, it's, it's doing pretty well. And fracking, I would say, you know, the third thing. You know, these, these are instances where the whole world changed because of luck and persistent and ingenuity that were characteristically Texan. And I think that those qualities uh, are very much enshrined in the mythology that we carry around about who we are. It's very interesting to me to hear you both talk about this in the sense of um, you know, you know the uh, you, you talked about the California kind of the, the the multiculturalism and how you use Houston as an example and you talk about you know this this multiculturalism that is here that is growing even more and so in a way I was thinking of a well-known Western historian who once said the West is where we all met and in, in some ways you can say Texas is where we all met right where everybody kind of comes together and and what what does that portend because it does not seem politically that that is happening, you, you know, there's still those really strict divides between, between the groups. And so there's, there's this melding of culture, there's this melding of, you know, the level three kind of brings it all together. But politically, there still seems to be very much stark, stark divides. I think cultural forces are more powerful than political forces. Mm -hmm. And eventually politics adjusts to take account of culture. Because when people decide to come to Houston, as when they decided to come to New York in the 19th century, they don't mm -hmm. think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to go, go where there's... where that's Republican or Democrat. They're right. going to go where the jobs are. Right. And that's sort of the basic thing. Texas has had a very vibrant economy mm -hmm. these last many years, and that's what draws people there. Right. And whether it's the oil economy or the high-tech economy or a budding movie economy or whatever it might yeah. be, as long as the engine of the Texas economy is, is running, mm -hmm. then people will keep coming. And, of course, this is one of the arguments that Texas governors have made vis-a-vis -vis California, mm -hmm. that California taxes, taxes people too much, it's too much regulation. And California is killing the goose that you know, laid the golden egg. Come to Texas, and we're not going to get in your way. You just make your own way. Mm -hmm. And so that part of the kind of the, the frontier mythology is still there. So that's interesting because that would suggest that Texas is on the front edge of this cultural change. I mean, as as things change here, the politics may be behind that, or maybe a, a, a symptom or a you know an afterthought of that. But the fact of the matter is, where Texas goes, so goes the nation. If, if you follow that logic. Maybe, but it's, the California economy was wide open yeah. years earlier. Uh, it may be that as economies mature, mm -hmm. as societies mature, people decide, you know, I would rather uh, not drink polluted water mm -hmm. than to let the frackers go to town wherever they want to go. Right. And so as the standard of living goes up, people pay more attention to environmental concerns. They pay more attention to the fact that they need health care, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Mm -hmm. So New York was like this in the 19th century. It was like sort of this wide open frontier of economics. 
And as people got wealthier, they asked more and more of government. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly not out of the question that could have happened in Texas. In fact, I mean, Texas has been unique in many ways. Will it continue mm -hmm. to be unique in that particularly Texan way? I don't know. Right. right. I do think, though, that uh, I, I think identity politics, to some extent, is what you were asking about, mm -hmm. and you know, and certainly we're very fractured in, in many respects. But it is st stunning to me how Texans rally to the identity of being Texan. Mm -hmm. It's a unifying force, right? And uh, it, it, I, I, Matthew McConaughey had a movie out a, a, several months ago. He plays a drug dealer in Detroit. And so uh, they had a screening, and uh, uh, some guy, Matthew, what do you think about how, how did Texas affect uh, uh, your th approach to this role? Well, it's, uh, it's about a drug dealer in Detroit. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but of course, growing up in, you know, Uvalde and that, you know, so, and then, you know, so two questions later, some guy in an orange T-shirt, hey, Matthew, what, you, what was so Texan about this movie for you? And, you know, he looked trapped, you know? Yeah. And they wanted to be uh, reaffirmed. You right. know, they wanted to, you know, have the blessing of, you know, being, this is some Texas experience we're having. And it was like, yeek, it's not, you know, but uh, it was, but I, I, I was struck again by how uh, people, were, people want to affiliate with the in, in these qualities that, that we ascribe to our myth are things that people want everybody to join hands and say, yes, this is us. And, and that can be a lunatic in that case, but it can also be, I think, a wonderful quality to help uh, politically to bring us together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had one more question, but I'm getting a signal that we're nearing the end of our time. So um, maybe when you go back to have your book signed, you can ask this. I, this notion of people uh, coming together, I thought that, Bill, your portrait of Henry Clay was just so compelling. Because here's a guy who spends his life as a compromiser, a, life, a, a guy trying to find a middle ground. And we all say in our private conversations, I just wish we had some centrist candidates. I wish we had some people in the middle that we could all relate to. Well. It didn't work out so well for, for, for Clay. He was sort of uh, uh, seen with an eye of suspicion on, on both sides. And, and, and I think that this, this, this difficulty of finding that compromise, finding that middle road, and I had sort of, uh, as an outsider, I'll tell you, I do look to Texas to see if, uh, if, if that can be done, because I feel like if it can be done here, it can probably be done anywhere. And that, that would be, uh, it would be a bellwether as opposed to a last gasp. And that's kind of, yeah. you know, kind of how I, I look at this as an outsider. But I just wanted to point out that uh, you can read all about Henry Clay in here, this lovely volume for $29.95 in the back. You're doing a good job of this. This one is uh, a beautiful portrait, very personal. Um, just we've talked about some of the anecdotes and things that are in it, but really a compelling, I mean, as a non-Texan, I found this. Uh, I, was, I would even be willing to put up with some of the undesirable parts of the climate that Bill referenced to, uh, to live in a place like this. Um, <laughs> This is sixteen ninety five, but I want you to know that the, the per page price is the same. So if you if you uh, if you choose to buy your books in that way, uh, you would uh, you, you'll come out even no matter what. You won't you won't be discriminated against in any way. But anyway, thank you all for being here. I will say God bless Texas. God bless America, and gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you.